This is Six Tackles with Gus, with Matthew Thompson and Gus Gould. Gus Gould. Great to be back with another episode of Six Tackles with Gus. There is so much to get through on this bumper episode today. South City in free fall and the coach has one game to save his job. The Wars are coming. Is this the team to deliver the Warriors their first premiership? It's Masters Week. We'll get some tips from Gus, the greatest week in golf, of course, which you can watch on 9 and 9 now. We'll ask Gus some questions and we'll get a bumper preview of round six. How are you doing? Matthew Thompson, really good, thank you. How are you? Good. Very you've, had, good. you've had surgery. Oh, yes. Very, a very serious procedure, but took half an hour. I'm good. What was uh, the surgery? Oh, I just had a little clean-up of my left knee. You probably noticed I've been hobbling around the joint for months. The blokes, at, there's 80-year-olds at my golf club who have been walking better than me, so I figured it was They're very good at that now, Dave. Oh, I've, I'd, I'd never been under before. That's an experience. Anesthetic? Yeah, never. Oh, crikey, I've been under a thousand I times. know, I know. That was more daunting than the actual procedure, but no, I was out like a light, and then I woke up, and it was all done. Walked and out of the joint. good today? Ah, uh, swollen, but it'll, it'll get there. I've you walked. know, back in the 60s and 70s, those sort of operations ended your career. Seriously? Yeah. Incredible. They used now, to slice now, you and dice you, didn't nowadays, they? Nowadays, they just little whisk in, whisk out, yeah. and, you know, you used to have a, a scar down your knee with 15 stitches either side of your knee to fix things I've got like two, that. I've got two little keyholes with a stitch in either of them. The scariest injury back then was a cartilage operation. Really? Yeah, that was the scariest thing. Wow. But, you know, I'd never heard of an ACL injury. or you know, I used to get medial ligaments and that, but I suppose the ACL, yeah. the knee just didn't repair back then. Well, without boring people, look, the technology is amazing. They get, I had cartilage floating through my knee. They take it out. They put it in a, they, they get it, like they get blood out of your arm. They spin it all together mm. and they put it back in. Put it back in. Yeah. So you're not bone on bone. Yeah. And then they let the scar tissue heal over it, and yeah. then they, they can put stuff in it to help it regenerate. It's amazing, isn't it? Where medicine's going is incredible. Stem cell, you know. Your grandkids will live to be 120. Well, hopefully I'll be here to see them. That'll be the average age, I reckon. They'll keep you alive that long. Uh, we did lose a legend of rugby league this week. I know it's been well publicised, but certainly we need to pay tribute to the late Keith Barnes here today, considered... Uh, well, look, he's royalty at Balmain, no question. 89 years of age, passed away in Prince of Wales Hospital, played 194 games for the famous Tigers, competed in three grand finals, captained Australia. He was initially born in Wales, actually, and had that, that lovely Welsh accent right throughout um, his life. He was never Australianised, if you will, um, but just a legend of the club. Um, went on to be an administrator as a, both a secretary and then a chief executive. And, of course, um, he was a tour manager for the Kangaroo Tour of, of 1990. But you think of the the icons of the Balmain Club, Gus. You think Keith Barnes, Golden Boots right at the top, and then Pierce and Roach and Elias and Sirenen. And uh, he was he was the CEO of that that club throughout that glorious period in the 80s, 90s when they were so great. Lovely man. A lovely man. Like a real nature's gentleman. Uh, man, he was, uh, yeah, uh, I got to meet him a number of times back in the day, not so much in recent times, but uh, I told a story on 100% footy the other night. Um, one of my earliest memories of going to a, a first grade football game, Dad took us one Sunday to, to Leichhardt Oval to watch Balmain play Newtown because Dad was mates with a few of the Newtown players and we went out there to watch Newtown play and we were playing, they were playing against Balmain, and the field used to run east-west. So yes, Leichhardt did. Oval, the field ran the other way, and the little Keith Barnes stand was over. That's that first one as you walk through the gates out there the corner, at Leichhardt yeah. Oval, and they had two little dressing rooms under that, which used to be the dressing rooms. You couldn't swing a cat in. I mean, when you had a shower, you had to go out into the corridor to dry yourself. There wasn't enough room <laughs> for everyone to do that. Well, but the field ran east-west, and we sat, we sat on the northern side of the ground, up back where those, under those trees are there now, and I remember the day distinctly because it was a very windy day. And at the time, Balmain had a goal kicker from South Africa, I think, called Len Colleen. Yeah, yeah. Len Colleen was a brilliant goal kicker, left footer, and he never used a tee or any mound or anything like that. He used to stick his heel in the ground, stand the ball straight up, take three paces back, three paces in, he could kick it a mile. He was absolutely brilliant. So... Keith Barnes was at the back end of his career and Len Colleen had taken over the goal kicking, but they were playing New Down this day and Len Colleen missed three in a row. It was very windy and they were having trouble holding the ball up there, get a man to hold the ball up for him to kick it and and all of that. So And the crowd was yelling out, give Keith Barnes a kick, give Golden Boots a kick, mm. give Golden Boots a kick. 
And Len Colleen comes up to kick this conversion from out wide and he could hear the crowd and he turned around and he threw the ball to Keith Barnes. And Keith Barnes very modestly took the ball and said, oh, all right, I'll have a kick, you know. And he kicked this ball and it went way out to the right and the wind blew it back and it sailed between the posts. The flags went, went up bananas. and the crowd went bananas. So it, mm. It's it, it's burned into me memory that moment of Len Colleen throwing Keith Barnes the ball. What a great story. So he could he could kick this goal. But he um, yeah, got to meet him uh, several times over the years and he was a lovely man. Yeah. Very, very highly regarded uh, in the game, not just at Balmain. Oh, just just part, well, really the beating heart of that club. So we send our uh, deepest condolences to the family and the friends of, of Keith Barnes. How old was he? He was 89. 89. 89. That's a good dig. Yeah. That's a good dig. And he'll be celebrated in appropriate fashion. I won't when say he... 89. Oh, come on. I'm no chance. Come on. I won't last that long. He'll be right. He used to be calling the footy. Um, there'll be a big celebration of his uh, extraordinary contribution to the club on Sunday where the Tigers play the Dragons. Well, Gus... There were some impressive teams in round five. Mm -hmm. Who was the best? Who was the best? Uh, there were some good wins. Um, Warrior, I thought, were terrific. I think Warriors announced themselves as a genuine premiership contender this year. They've been good. They had a great year last year, and they've been good, but you can just feel what's building there. Even under strength a little bit, they just went out and professionally dismantled the South Sydney defensive system in what was virtually a training gallop for them. Mm. They did it so comfortably. There was some really good signs, positive signs for them. They've got depth in key positions. They've got some really smart playmakers now. And um, Roger Tuovasa Shek has come back and added a new dimension. I think Wade Egan is now developing into one of the game's premier dummy halves. Uh, it's just got a really good look about it right at the moment. No, I thought the Warriors were extremely impressive. I thought the Raiders were terrific. They're just about my favourite team in the comp, the Raiders. The Raiders? You're yeah, good, the but, Raiders? but I love – everyone has dismissed them out of hand at the start of the year. Well, at the start uh, of the year – Well, you said they wouldn't get the spoon. You said they would get the – well, you, well didn't, no. you didn't say they'd get the spoon. People were saying they think they'll get the spoon. But the way Ricky has coached that team and and the um, just the sheer um, – the desire in that team and the strength of their pack, they're a bloody good side. They're very fit. Yeah. They're very fit. They're doing well in the lower grades, in the two senior lower grades. So they've obviously got depth. They've, they've worked on their pathways a lot over the last few years. There's a few of those starting to filter through to the first grade side. Chevy Stewart, is he as fast as his name sounds? <clears throat> yeah, he's quick. He came from Cronulla. He was um, he was in the Cronulla system and they recruited him into the junior reps a couple of years ago when he was 17 or so. Uh, goal kicker, um, he's... How can I say he's a Pappenhausen type? Ooh. Yeah, he's very quick and you know support player and um, yeah. Are you ready to go? Oh, he'll be ready. Yeah, yeah. He won't be. He won't be scared. He's uh, a kid that'll back himself. Their forwards are doing a really good job. They, they are. They are very fit. They're much fitter than they've been in previous seasons. And Ricky said that's because it's taken a couple of off seasons to get the strength and conditioning a hundred percent right and get the players to buy in. Um, He's very, very happy with that part of it. He was shattered about the Cronulla result the week before. So a good sign that they bounced back as strongly as they did. Mm. Albeit, and I've said on this podcast a couple of times, Parramatta are going to struggle without Mitchell Moses, and they have done in the two games that they've played without him. And they were rudderless the other night, and they were just easy meat. And they, But the Raiders were, were terrific. Mm. Um, some Ripped them to really shreds. good, Really good tries, you know, dominant, defensively strong Raiders in the past years, you know, like they'd win that game 36-30 or something. You know, yeah. they were just ruthless the other night, which was a good sign. So for me, the Warriors and the Raiders were very impressive. Sea Eagles, gee whiz, not many teams do that to the Panthers, do they? That's they a were, funny game. I've, I call that for radio with Daryl and, and Gal. And Penrith in the first 10 minutes, like they were going to do what they always do. Mm. And Manly kind of just arrested back the momentum, and they they blew them away. But especially in the forwards, they big pack just destroyed yeah, them. Yeah, a milestone game for Daly Cherry Evans back at home. Really disappointing the week before. I mean, they were horrible against the Dragons. Awful. They were horrible. And look, the Dragons Manly game was probably in the top five worst games I've seen in a long time. <laughs> it was an awful game, and you know that that form held up. Dragons uh, were poor as well against Newcastle and. Uh, Manly really bounced back, which again is a good sign. When your team can do that, uh, can bounce back, and it usually happens coming back to home. Teams getting beaten badly on the on the road coming home is a very good model for tipping. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
and Manly were, were too good for the Panthers. So there were some there were good performances. There were some poor performances on the weekend. There were some really good games. Um, yeah, there was. Yeah. Um, hey, do, you've seen more footy than just about anyone. Do, do you still get do you still get nervous watching a, watching your team lead by what was it twenty? What was the score? Bulldogs lead Who by Bulldogs? what? Were they lead by? Well, I was I was in here because I was working yeah. on the game afterwards, and um, what, was the, what was the score? I, I waited till half time to go and get. Makeup yeah. done before we go, and I get up there, and there's big Paul Gallon. He said, "Oh, you must be happy with how that's going. Twenty six nil. That's what's only half time, mate." You so, didn't genuinely think they'd come back and make it that close, did you? Well, I knew there'd be a comeback. There, there, there always is. I mean, you, you you can't rest on your laurels there. But there was a lot of mitigating circumstances in that game. I'll talk about it later. But yeah. as I said, you know, I've heard a lot about the Roosters' plight on the night, but the Bulldogs had to overcome an extreme amount of adversity in that game. To eventually get, they had to win the game twice. They went out and won it in the first half. Then, with twenty minutes to go, it's only twenty to twenty six twenty, and the bull and the roosters were probably favourites at that stage. You know, people saying they had twelve men. Well, they had twelve functioning men, twelve very good players on the field that you know had a burr under their saddle and were obviously trying to. Um, poor old bulldogs probably had about eight or nine functioning players right. at, at that time. They had a lot of players that, under normal circumstances, wouldn't have been out there. They lost four players prior to the match. They lost Harry Edwards and Chris Patola. They only played mm. eight or ten minutes each. Uh, Connor Tracy couldn't run because he'd strained a calf muscle. Max King had broken a hand, shouldn't have gone back out. Kurt Mann had broken a hand, shouldn't have gone back out. Wow. Uh, kick out was a passenger virtually for the last 20 minutes. They had to move Burton to the centres to accommodate the 18th man Sexton coming yeah. on the field. Um, uh, Jamin Salmon has been battling with injury for a couple of weeks. You know, there was a, a number of things that happened during the game. So... Um, you know, whilst whilst it looked as though a game of two halves, I was particularly impressed with the way the Bulldogs actually held on, mm-hmm. given that they got themselves in that position. Now, it, it can happen. It's happened to all of us at some stage where you've had a big lead and the other side starts to come back. For me, the key to stopping the comeback is to stop the first one. If you if you if you don't if you stop the first one or delay it as long as possible, you can delay the comeback. Unfortunately, they went straight out and. Roosters were able to put on a couple of tries really quickly. Being down to 12 men, if you're going to be down to 12 men for any length of time, playing on a rain sodden night in those sort of conditions is the night to be down to 12 men. It's not as big a disadvantage as what it would be on a fast, hot, uh, dry, mm. fast track. Mm. The other positive for the Bulldogs was that they only had one visit to the Roosters' end of the field in the whole second half and scored a try. And they ended up being the winning try for them. So, so it was a gutsy, gutsy effort to hang on. It wasn't. They almost blew it. It was, it was they a did terrific. Well to win. Yeah, I don't want to advertise it no. too much. But and and it's not as though we were four dollars fifty going into the. We were rank outsiders At going least. into the clash. We weren't playing, right. you know, slouches. We were playing the Roosters. who have got the best roster in the league, um, and so it was promising signs. It's. Um, it's, Very good. It, it is promising. They're, they're uh, obviously got to go to Melbourne this week and Newcastle the week after, and then get the bye and. They'll be sweating on that bye just to, to get some players back from injury or what have you. So it's it's going to be tough, but they're playing tough. They're playing – they're so much improved on what they showed last year in the last couple of years. I'm very happy with them at the moment. Yes! No, 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 no. Hey, you, no. That's the rule. No. No. Dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. All right, Gussie, put your big ones out there with this first one. After five rounds, the Warriors are now the Premiership favourites. No, oh, no, 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 no. Well, where are you making them favourites? I don't know. Jordan, that's Jordan's question. Warriors favourites. I think I declared them as top four certainties at the start mm. of the year, and um, I'm happy with that selection. I've got no reason to change that. And they are genuinely – prim- the more this competition unfolds um, and looking at those top teams, you know, Bronco – Panther, you know, they're only a couple of injuries away from being mm. a bit more vulnerable than people think. I think um, the Panthers are a little shaky. Well, they've still got the professionalism and, and their top side is very, very good. But, um, you know, they, they're only a couple of – everyone's only a couple of injuries away from, from being vulnerable. Um, I still think Panthers are entitled to favouritism and they're going to be extremely hard to beat. They look tired on the weekend. Yeah, well, they're not robots. Mate. No, they're they not. Are, they they are. Are. They've been up for a long, long time. That's, and that's my concern with the Panthers. And they put a lot into that. I know they were under strength the week before against the Roosters and uh, Logged them. put in a phenomenal performance. And it's, you know, Manly's not an easy place to win at the best of times. Um, and they were sort of found a little bit wanting. But that's going to happen. You, you, you're going to get days like that. 
Uh, that's probably the biggest beating the Panthers have had in some time. Uh, yeah, I still see them as favourites. And Broncos, when they get back to full strength, they're going through an injury run at the moment, aren't they? Um, they lost they get, more today. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the competition could look very, very differently in three or four months' time. And the Warriors have got the depth. I think they're certainly for top four. Um, as I said earlier on, I think they're a team that is a genuine title challenger. I've said about Manly, if Tom Trebojevic stays fit and healthy, then they are a top four team and, and they're a chance um, outside of those, you know, I think everyone else, probably next seven or eight are pretty even. Mm. They'll fight out the rest of the top eight and then you've got your bottom sides that are, are trying to get out of the eight. And, you know, they're all showing signs of improvement. I think Tigers and Bulldogs and... Dragons have all shown signs of improvement. The Titans are going through a tough period at the moment. Uh, Dolphins, again, look as though they've improved on last year. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting competition and a couple of injuries to any team. Can, well, if the Warriors can, lose Sean Johnson, it's curtains. Uh, maybe, but they've got, um, Sha uh, what's his name, uh, Tavita Harris back now and they've got Tamare Martin back now. Um but, you know, like, but yeah, Sean, to your John, point, Sean, if Sean, anyone loses their gun half, yeah. you know, oh, if, if they, the competition's so even, if they you're, lost up, you're Wade, up against it. If they lost Wade Egan, yeah. it's going to make a big difference. Wade Egan, for me, was nearly the player of the round last week. Like, he was tremendous. And I, I've always had an opinion of him because we had him, he's a Lithgow oh. boy. We had him in the Panthers system and uh, um, he went off to the Warriors to play regular first grade because he had, his pathway was blocked at the Panthers. But over time, he's mm. really developed into one of the game's uh, top dummy half, and I think his best is in front of him. Uh, these playmaker roles, I was talking to a player, I've been having meetings since 6 o'clock this morning, and we're talking about the development of players and coming through. You know, I've got the data to back this up, but in the key playmaker positions, your career span is now, your best career span is from 25 years of age to 35 years of age. Mm -hmm. we've, got, we've got to stop thinking and judging playmakers at 18 years of age, 20 years of age, even 22, 24 years of age. You, you, your, your career as a full-time, fully-fledged NRL playmaker, fullback, halfback, 5'8", you know, hooker, dummy half, the, your career, your best career, if you can get through to 25 years of age and learn your craft, your best years are going to be between 25 and 35. All our top playmakers mm. are, are late in their career. Um, and I think as a game and as development people and as recruiters of talent and I think the system, our system of our development pathways and our development salary cap and our supplementary salary cap is so wrong. It's so, it's so poorly thought out and it, it, we've got to keep them in the game longer and be able to pay them accordingly to keep up their development because mm. the key years for these people is between 25 and 35 and we're making decisions and putting pressure on young playmakers way too early. Sounds like that's your next campaign. Hey, um, Wade Egan's a Lithgow shamrock. Do you yeah. know who the other, do you know another famous Lithgow Shamrock? Lithgow Shamrock. Rampaging Roy Slavin. Oh, was he? Yeah. Lithgow Shamrock. And he's, who was his coach? Gra grassy someone. <laughs> Remember he talks about. Where was TV Ted Ellery from? <laughs> oh, I think he was parked. That's a bit before my time, I think. Yeah, TV Ted Ellery. The great I, Rampaging I played, Roy Slavin. I played against TV Ted in Lithgow. Oh, he's a real bloke. He was a real black. Yeah, right. When the Amco Cup first came out, Western Division won the yeah, Amco Cup famous, back in famous. 1974 or something. And they had a black, a bald black, used to come off the bench called TV Ted Ellery. He looked like a black who should have been in World Championship Wrestling. He had the bald head <laughs> and he would come off. The, and they said he only ever played that good when he was on TV. They said he, was, <laughs> he was hopeless any other time. They, they called him TV Ted. He used to have these cam oh. cameos off the bench. <laughs> and he'd come off and he was a real, he was a real uh, player. My one of my first ever under twenty threes games was a game up at Lithgow oh. in a pre season game. I was eighteen years of age and I played against T V Ted Ellery. Right. So you starstruck. No. You starstruck. Yeah, it's T V Ted. <laughs> T V Ted. He was the opposition lock forward. How'd he go? Like a busted? Oh, we beat him. <laughs> no TV cameras there. They hadn't done much training at that stage of the year. Now this this question answers itself after what we saw last week. The Knights are the most loyal fans in the comp. What about old mate eating his, eating his hot dog in the pouring rain? <laughs> exactly. did, you, did you ever see that show we had um, Sunday roast? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Andrew Voss, yeah. he had the conspiracy about the South Sydney fan who brought his hot dogs in in a thermos. 
Look oh, it up. It, yeah, it, it'll be on that. YouTube. Yeah, yeah. It'll be on YouTube. He, he had his. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He had a thermos yeah. and he opened up the thermos. He pulled hot out hot dogs. So he didn't have to pay for his hot dogs at the concession stand. Well, old mate up at Newcastle bought his, and he's. I think he might have had his son with him. He was trying to eat, eat with a poncho over his head, and the rain's coming in sideways. Ooh, love you got. They to got. Un- they got like how many? How many they get there? It was well over ten. Yeah, you got it. You got to understand who our real fans are. Who the the, the real punter, the real fan. You got to understand where they are and what football means to them. And it was awesome. Newcastle, uh, you know, they are the epitome of what the rugby league fan is and should be. How do you know they played like proper wet weather footy? They shortened up their passing. Like they played. Yeah, they they were, were really good. They were good. Really good. Uh, the they tie- had to be. Yeah. The Tigers' days are finishing with a spooner over, Gussie. Yes! Yeah, I've, I've sort of been backing them for 18 months and saying that they're a really good kid, really good side on the uh, the emergence here, and I, and I thoroughly believe it. They've got some really good young talent there. Again, that Dolphins-Tigers game on the weekend, I, the one comment I came out of it was both these teams will win more games. Yeah, I thought they both went all right. Um, you know, Tigers were looking for two in a row. It didn't happen for them. and Three. Um, looking for three on a row, and 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 they're going good. They're, mm. they're going good. They really are. They're they're a much improved team, and uh, all credit to them. And they'll only get better. That's there's a good side developing there. But I think their days of wooden spoon are long behind them. So Jeez, I'll tell a little you bit of light at the end of the tunnel. I reckon they're living, breathing certainties this week. Who? Tiger. Who do they play? Dragon. Golden mm. tribute to Golden Boots. All that. They'll be winning. Where are they playing? I think it's Campbelltown. Campbelltown. Hmm. You think they'd switch it to Leichhardt for Golden Boots, wouldn't you? Good call. Can't I can't believe they're not going to give them money to keep the keep. But what you got to keep Leichhardt going. Anyway, we've talked about this. Um, last question, Gus. Bennett, back to the bunnies. No, 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 no. I'm saying a zillion to one. I'm saying he'll be there. I'm, I've been wrong before, but I'm saying a zillion to one. Why? If this if this coach doesn't last, Bennett's finished at the Dolphins, why wouldn't he go to South? I just don't think he'll backtrack. I don't yeah. think he'll do it. So the only club he's been be to wrong. twice I mean, is Wayne, Wayne Bennett takes on all sorts of roles and he's prepared to put his jersey in the line anywhere. I would think that with the game looking for expansion into you know, an 18th team and maybe a 19th and a 20th team, He's pretty close to Peter Volandis, and I think Peter Volandis mm-hmm. would have him earmarked for you know, a reconnaissance to, to see where the next franchise comes from and, and whether he could assist with that. Uh, I don't know what Wayne Bennett... I don't, I don't really think Wayne Bennett wants to leave Queensland at the moment, but only he could answer that. You, you wouldn't know with Wayne. He, he keeps his cards pretty close to his chest. It would obviously be a coup for South Sydney if he was to do that, and he'd be much sought after uh, just on sheer man management. Uh, but... Um, I, I'm saying no, but I, I have no reason to say that. I've got no inside information. I, I just, I don't see him doing it. Well, that's the segue because the rabbits were back at training yesterday. They were all over the new services, obviously. Uh, Gus's comments questioning Latrell's love of the game and whether it still remains, which he firstly aired on our podcast last week and then repeated on 100% footy on Monday evening, triggered a reply from the club. Um, Latrell was in meetings yesterday. His best mate, Jack White, was stuck up to front in the media yesterday and he wasn't all that keen to talk. You know him well. Does, does Latrell want to play the game? Of course he wants to play the game. Um, and I said the other week when uh, people started asking about Latrell, I'm not here to talk about Latrell. You just want to talk about him, you ask him, all right? So. <laughs> Poor Jack. I think he probably should have known he was going to get hammered with those questions. Um, on Latrell, he had a meeting with South Hierarchy yesterday. It's been reported today that he and his management sat down and said he is all in. Um, the club has had some concerns regarding his focus, whether he's focused on the right areas. They're investing a million dollars a year into him. He's not playing like a million dollar a year player. They wanted uh, reassurances that his head is in the right spot. Both he and his management said yesterday it was. In fact, Latrell met with his management before the meeting with South Hierarchy and had to convince them. They said that what he was saying and his body language didn't match, but everyone's come away a uh, apparently on the same page. And Latrell has vowed to be at every training session for the next three weeks to try and help the team um, while he's suspended. I've got to say, Gus, I don't think I've seen so much publicity around one single player in the game. He dominates everything at Souths. Uh, they're a team that features some great players. 
Among them, one of the great modern-day forwards in the captain, Cam Murray. We never hear from him. Um, you said, I thought on Monday, I thought you spoke brilliantly, you said there is a divide, there's the South team, and then there's the Trell who looks at times like he's running his own race. Yeah, I never said there was a divide. I said the way I look at it is Latrell plays his game and runs his race, and then there's the rest of the team. And the team, as they have done since my comments, you know, which I'm I'm here to offer an opinion and yes. look at what I see, um, they're always very supportive of him. The game is always supportive of him. You know, South Sydney are always supportive of him. His teammates are always supportive of him. But I'm saying that. Latrell doesn't always repay that faith and doesn't always repay that opinion, nor does he back it up as he should, as I believe he should. And sometimes it's just as simple as sitting down and asking him the question. Now, I, all I raised was, has anyone actually sat him down and asked him? Has anyone actually sat down and told him what it looks like? And maybe he doesn't understand that that's what it looks like, or maybe that doesn't really portray his passion for the game or what he wants to do. But baby, that's what it looks like. You know, you are in the crosshairs of the media and the fans and, and everyone else who follows the game and they are watching you intently. Now, that's a pressure that comes. That's a scrutiny, you know, whether it's fair or unfair, but that's why you get the big bucks, baby, and that's what he is. And there is high, high expectation yeah. on him. So you I'm just glad mentioned the big bucks if, if, if that if that If that conversation has taken place with management yesterday, why has that taken so long to have that conversation? Well, it may have happened before, but it we may have happened about. before, but it, 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 it it shows we're on the right track. I'm mm. not. I'm not targeting Latrell with any of, of my commentary of Latrell Mitchell. Ninety nine percent of it is is about the great football that he plays. But um, there is no doubt that he still needs some education and support in what is a team game mm. and mm. what you know and who he plays for and how yeah. he plays it. You mentioned it's, the it's big a very bucks. simple question. And Andrew Johns is big on this. He's said this for years and years, and I'm sure you'll have your own thoughts. If you if you if you take the top dollar at a club, if you're on the big bucks, if you're the number one man, you you have an obligation to drive that club. Andrew says, you know, if Nathan Cleary's on all the money he's on, then he is the marquee bloke at the club. He said that about Carlin Ponga. You're the leader, you're the man that has to drive everything that happens at the club. That's not happening with the trail. No, in, in in certain parts of the game, that's obvious. In certain parts of the game, that's obvious. You know, it's um, if you look at the great leaders in the game and the highest paid players in the game, they, they are there from the first minute, every play, every minute for the full 80 minutes. They never give up. They never give up on a play. Uh, they're driving. They're setting the example. And I guess that's what people expect of their leaders and their highest paid players. Now, Latrell came through with the Roosters, who had a number of players who were like that. He's come through with the Jared Weir Hargreaves and the Boyd Cordners and the Jake Friends and yeah. you know the Cooper Cronks and you know all those James Malone, all those great players that he played with. They were responsible for all that. Mm. Where Latrell hasn't gravitated in his career is to go through and now be that player and and and, and lead that way. As a young fella, he benefited from the experience and the work ethic and everything that was around him. Mm. Um, but that is the evol- it's the circle of life. That's yeah, it the is. evolution. It's it's one of the it's it's a great subject. This is because um, all, all through the time when you're developing clubs and and bringing through pathways and and trying to develop a club from the game up, and I kept saying that when when the senior players up at Panthers are the blokes that started here as sixteen and seventeen year olds. Mm then your club will have come full circle mm. and these leaders of your club will be driving the standards and the culture and everything through. So your Fisher-Harris, your Moses, your Liam Martin, your Osai Yeos, your Nathan Clearys, Jerome Lewis, Dylan Edwards, who all came to the club as 17-year-olds, are now the club leaders and senior players in the club. What a great model. Well, that, that's wonderful. You're not trying to import leadership or import you know, those sorts of things. You've actually you developed. Do. And these kids who come through that system know exactly what that system looks like. Melbourne were very good at it for a number of years, you know. So, um, you know, other teams have been good at it. Um, Panthers is the best model at the moment. But um, that's what every club now, I think, aspires to do. They all want a system like that. And Latrell, the evolution of the footballer is – you take on that responsibility as your profile increases, as your role within the team becomes more important, as you become one of the highest paid and leaders in the team. And some of our leaders are getting a lot less money than other players, you know, because they've just got that naturally in them. 
Now, maybe that's a responsibility that Latrell doesn't want, can't handle, or doesn't understand, but that's part of his education. That's a part of the relationship between his coaches and, and the players. That's, got to, that's the part of his game and personality that's got to be developed. Now, I don't know if anyone's done that. I don't know if they've tried to do it. I don't know if they've tried and failed or haven't done it or they've been too scared to do it or whether the trail's been less. I don't know. All I'm saying is, looking from the outside, looking in, has anyone actually asked this question and mm. sat him down and asked it? Because this is what it looks like. This is how it's perceived, you know? And when the team gets beaten, you're going to get the blame for it. The leader is going to get the blame for it mm. in that sure. situation. So, um, you know, it's, it's without judgment, it's a comment. And, and I'm glad that conversation has taken place. I'm not saying that my comments have instigated that, but I think... Uh, again, letting his team down by getting suspended from the weekend, and there should have been a much worse suspension. Well, this is the other thing I want to point out. I mean, he has this he has this propensity to implode when things get hard. I mean, I think back to the Manu thing yep. a few years back where he left him with a fractured cheekbone and ended his season. Well, I think that was an accident, but uh, well, that's, that's my personal well, opinion. Well, anyway, but, 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 but for yes, him they, to go to Johnson with the four, and then, he has then later before. to pick the bloke with... To blatantly put his hand between the legs and try and spear a bloke, what's he thinking? There has, he has lashed out. There's no reason. There's no risk he's lashed out. He doesn't, um, you know, and that, 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 that's all things about attitude control and, you know, mental toughness and all those sort of things that professional footballers, we're trying to instill in them all the time. Coaches are always trying to instill in this and how you react to setbacks and how you react to, you know, and, and how you keep focus and stay in the moment and um, and don't worry about what's happened and don't, trying to worry about what might not happen. Um, you know, and and I, I said five or six years ago, I think it was on a show, I was sitting on a panel there with Billy Slater or something, I said, unless someone reins this in, if, if you keep sticking up for him when he's obviously doing the wrong thing, yeah. that will only get worse over time. Now, Luttrell is a phenomenal footballer. He's an elite talent. He can influence the scoreboard in a heartbeat. When he gets his dander up and he wants to play, there are very few that can t contain him. He is a beast of a thing. He's quick, he's big, he's strong, he's skillful. He plays without fear. It just comes in fits and spurts. Well, but when's the last time he when's the last time he did that? Well, he's not doing it at the moment. But when's the last time I mean, everyone says this and this is true, like we've seen him play some phenomenal games. When's the last time he did well, that? Well, I said that halfway through last year and everyone handed me about it. Why? Because they want to stick up for Latrell. Because that because it's Latrell, it becomes newsworthy. All right. But somewhere along the line, you've got you know, we spoke about this last week about coaches and their their they they're, they're hardest on their most talented players. They're hardest on their leaders because that's helping them set the standard and understand where they are. You know, I hope I hope good things come out of this conversation with management. I hope that, you know, it's reached a point where Latrell understands even more. And I hope that Latrell responds. I hope he's turned around and says, No, I love the game. Show me show me how I show that. Show me how I do that. Show me what what is it that you don't think I'm doing for the team and tell me what it is. I don't know if anyone's ever done that. Well, there's two elements about this coaching thing. Now they say, I mean, look, when these stories get out, it's inevitable. There's 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 moves at play. But the coach was chips in with Latrell and Cody, which is what sparked the Burgess thing. That's the first. And so if, if he gets the result, what does that say to the rest of the club? And secondly, I read Jason Demetrio took on the responsibility to look after the team's defence. Well, they couldn't tackle you and me at the moment. Yeah, well, I, don't, I don't know about any of that. Why is the head coach not allowed to coach? No, but I'm saying these are the two elements I think that stand out. Like He, he, he unreservedly backed... Latrell and Cody in his relationship with them when Sam Burgess challenged whether there was equality across the playing yeah, group last year. Coaches and players, they do that publicly, mate. They do that publicly, even though privately their opinion might be different. But do you or their frustration? But we're seeing nothing different. from Latrell to say that he's being he's being urged by the coach to be better. I mean he said in the press conference he's got to be better, but he's done nothing to show that that's Oh, I wouldn't. But anyhow, him, but yeah. but the coach has taken on the but this this these are the the um these are the main points of contention, I suppose, that there was a restructure with Burgess leaving, et cetera, and uh, the coach took on the defensive coaching responsibilities and that's fallen apart. So there's obviously, you know, the whole implosion yeah, has been... A, has a been... Lot of, they've got a lot of issues with their team that have got, you know, um, whether they're under the control of the head coach or not, I don't, I'm not so sure. I think the club... Um, the club's got to take some responsibility for this and I'm sure they see it now. They probably were in denial 12 months ago. 
mm. uh, when it was raised. Because halfway through last year, I think they were nearly near the lead of the competition, weren't they? And we started talk. I started talking about it then. And, you know, that's – I'm working in the media. That's – they're things that I saw. Well, maybe they were in denial then, but I don't think they're in denial now. They won five of their last 17 games. Yeah, I don't think they're in the de- denial now. There's obviously an issue, uh, whether it be around player development, leadership development, you know, um, strength and conditioning, um, the, the type of player that they've brought through the system, players they've let go, staff they've let go. There could be a whole range of things, and each one of them is a factor. They're all a factor. Mm. There's no one thing that's caused South Sydney to be where it is. It's a whole factor. There, there, there are a number of factors, and you've got to weight each factor accordingly in how to fix it and which one to attack first and which one's got the priority and more important. But I guarantee you that if you go back over the club over the last two, over last two years, there'll be a number of little events that have taken place and things that have happened and mm. people that have come and gone... All right, that was a factor. Okay, that was a, or we didn't replace that properly, or we underestimated that, or we, you know we didn't focus enough on that, or we let that slide through. What you walk past is what you accept. When you accept it, it's going to come back and bite you, particularly if it's not the standard that you need. So this is the stuff you've done over the last ten years. It's 15 the stuff years, that's it? stuff that's happened in professional sports since time began. But particularly since you've moved everyone into administration. goes through it. So, everyone goes through it. Mm. Everyone goes through it. Every, everyone has been in a situation like this, right? And remembering, they've come through five or six years of making the top four and being in the last four, been to a grand final. I mean, they've had a wonderful period, mm. right? So whether or not they've prepared for this time where there's a bit of downtime or the, the roster's starting to thin a little bit or, you know, key positions, you know, they, they let Adam Reynolds go and didn't really have a, a ready-made, experienced halfback. And I've said to you, the best yeah, yeah. playmaker years are between 25 and 35. Well, they didn't really have that um, to replace Adam Reynolds. So there's there's a number of little – everything's contributed along the way. And that's – but I could go to a number of clubs and say exactly the same thing, all right? South Sydney, high profile. Luttrell, high profile. This is the, the story of the week because they're one from five. Um, so this is where the league is – where media is going to focus itself at the moment because – it sells newspapers. It sells media. It, it, you know, everyone's watching it and and seeing how it goes. But so why sack the coach if it's, they get beat the this cl- week? I don't think they will. I don't think they should. And I you don't. don't th- you don't think that? But that doesn't really change. I don't think it, ever, it doesn't change much. I don't think it? it ever comes down to one game. But look, I don't think it ever comes down to one game. But but let's say for instance, South Sydney went out this weekend and didn't try a yard. Not that I expect that to happen. And they got beat by forty or something or other. And then people go well. This isn't going to get any better. Yeah. All right. Maybe we need to make a change just to save the ones that we've got here. And a lot of clubs have been in that position in time. Maybe the coach falls on his sword. I mean, it's just what happens. I've been in situations where the coach has just said, I can't, me and my family can't stand this anymore. I can't live like this. All right. And it becomes obvious to them, I can't fix this. Mm. All right. I need to be in another situation and start again. That happens from time to time. Um, you know, it's high pressure this this coaching stuff. It, it really is. The scrutiny on it is incredible. The people commenting on it is bigger than ever before. The magazine shows, the, and the, the media is a beast in, yeah. in these areas, and they're feeding frenzy at the moment on South Sydney. Now, there is only one thing that's going to change that, and that's the South Sydney club as a whole pulling together and addressing honest self-appraisal a, in what's happened, what could we control, what can't we control, how can we improve and what are our priorities and where do we start and not looking for quick fixes. There are no quick fixes. You know, it's just, it comes through hard work. And you, what you can do is you can sp- start to spiral out of control because you are in denial or you don't actually see it and it's easier for people from the outside to see that when you're in it maybe the solutions aren't as obvious when you're in it you tend you get you get caught up in the turmoil of it being in a losing club is the worst it's a terrible place to be it's hard work and you've got to hold your staff together and hold your management together and everyone hold their nerve together because you're going to be picked on by all these outside forces you've got, you've got members you've got sponsors you've got media you've got people you know picking your bones away at the bones and and sometimes you haven't got the solution for it right now but we've got to tough it out together because how we tough it out and how we respond to it will determine how well we come out of it on the other side. We've all been there. 
all of us have been there at some stage, all right? And South Sydney, it's their turn at the moment, right? They've been highly successful, highly successful. Ever, you know, with Russell Crowe, we turned that club around and uh, Michael Maguire won a premiership with him and the Burgess brothers and they were flying high and they've been in the top four ever since and Cody Walkers and Cameron Murrays and Damian Cooks and, you know, they've all been, you know, They've got a winger that's going to break the world, the, the, the all-time point scoring record, the all-time try scoring record. I mean, there's a lot of great things that have happened around South Sydney in the last decade or so. The downtimes, the downturns come and they just haven't seen it coming. They, well, they weren't prepared for it or they're at the point, all right, well, okay, this is more serious than we thought. Yeah. Now, Jason Demetrio might be the perfect person to get him out of that if the focus is right, if they understand now what they're doing, all right? If, if they're trying to hold on to what they were two years ago, then that's gone on too long. Well, it feels like that's what's been happening. They're not developing for the future yet. They need to probably refocus about what their priorities are now moving forward so that in 18 months' time, they're in a hell of a lot better position than they are now. And in three or four years' time, they're back to where they were. It's funny how when you're not going to a well, you, you, you get hit by injuries too. Like they've got a lot of blokes out hurt at the same time. Well, but it all sort of it never rains at pause. What comes first, the chicken or the egg? You know, yeah. like those sort of. And the way our rosters are this day, with the 17-team competition, with the diminished development that's either come through COVID or, or club spending less. Matt, I could talk about this for hours. The pool of players, every club in the in the league is vulnerable if the wrong blokes get injured. Look at the Parramatta Eels. They've got a great roster. It's a great team. It's Two years ago, they went to a grand final. You take Mitchell Moses out of that side, mm. they're struggling to score a try, let alone win a game. That's how that's how vulnerable a team can be. Gee, you're good. In this day and you age. You knew I was going to talk about para. You've just Did taken I? me straight onto it. I said this three weeks ago. I know. Do you reckon they should unleash the kid, Ethan Sanders? So young um, young Blaze Talungi's out. Dejan yep. Arcee's in, but yep. they've stayed stayed with Brown at half. Yeah. yeah I don't think Brown's a seven. Look. Um, Good runner. My, 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 th- there's two things that I've relied upon is that, particularly in those roles, you, you, you put a specialist in. You know, if, if, if you lose a halfback, put a bloke in who plays halfback. Don't try to manufacture one out of another player. That's only putting a finger in the dot. Sometimes you've got to do that. Because the only halfback your option has got is too young or he's, he's not quite physically ready or mentally ready for it. I don't want to expose him to this. My team's working, weakened through injuries and other points, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, a lot depends on the maturity of that person. I think it's nearly got to the point where Parramatta are nearly at full strength in most other positions. Um, I think it was a big ask on young Blaze to, to play in that position rather than a genuine number seven. I think it's taken away from Dylan Brown's uh, strengths to play him as a game manager number seven. He's not. He's not that. Um, he looks more like a fullback than than a playmaking half to me. But he's really been a good five eight, and he's done a great job there. Um, they've got that young halfback. I don't know the boy, so I've never spoken to him. I don't know whether he's ready to do it. Maybe if the rest of the side is really strong, he's a, if he's a genuine seven and he can kick and he can support and he can stand in front of tackles. That's probably all you need him to do. It's up to the others to lift their game and go again. Um, But my other thought is, and particularly with positions, is um, I'll have players, if I've got, if I'm in a development phase of a, you know, we're in one now at the Bulldogs, rather than rushing young fellas too early, I will buy players that are journeymen. They've been in the game for a while. They might be towards the back end of their career, but it's their job to go out and take these bruises. It's their job to go out and deal with this. And it's only to save the kids from being rushed too early and exposed too early and losing confidence and losing and getting hurt. You know, I don't, I don't want to do that. So it's, you know, and that just comes down to experience and you've got to be in the system. You've got to be in the club to know where players are at certain parts of their career. But there is no doubt, you know, during my time in developing clubs or developing football teams that there'll be players there that are just there to take the bruises. They're just there to come in and do the work until kids are ready. Yeah. No risk about that. But with respect to with Ethan um, Sanders, uh, Brad Arthur could take heart, surely, with what Ethan Strange has done down at Canberra and even Lachlan Galvin at the West Tigers. Yep. Two kids that have just thrived. And Ethan Strange, the mole, saying today that he's about to sign a long-term deal 
um, as the long, long-term long 5 eighth at Canberra, taking on the, the role of Jack Whiten. The best people to decide that are the people at Parramatta, not from us sitting no, on no. the outside. You know, we've seen enough of him in the lower grades. He's obviously a talent. He's going to play NRL at some stage. But he comes through those junior reps and but origins. He, and that he's, not, he's not going to replace Mitchell Moses. He, he's not. He's not going to replace Mitchell Moses. No. So how does the team... How does the team then um, manipulate its football or, or, or assign its roles to play a brand of football where they don't need so much from Mitchell Moses? And I think all they've done is weaken positions to, to fill a position and they're never going to get close to, to fulfilling mm. what. So if he's not there, all right, how do we play our football now and where do we go from there? And I'm sure Brad Arthur's trying to work on that. It's not easy in just a couple of weeks, and you've seen because he's not there what's happened to them. Mm. That will get better over time until he gets back in six or eight weeks' time and he solves well, the problem himself. The problem is they've got two wins from their but first our, five, and if he's yeah. back in round 12, season uh, might be over. That's what I'm saying about the Warriors. I mean, the Warriors lost young um, Metcalf, and um, you know they had uh, Chanel Harris-Tavita who's come back. They've got Tamare Martin. They've, they've got depth in those spots. There's very few clubs that can actually boast that. Panthers, and you know, over the last few years, have bought a Sean o, Sean O'Sullivan. They've bought a uh, Jack Cogger. They've now bought um, the young boy from Canberra who went over to England, Snyder, mm. uh, who can fill a role for a couple of weeks. Mm. But they're not Nathan Cleary. No, no. Well, the Warriors talk about depth. We're arguing if Chanel or Rogers should be playing fullback. Sure, they're in the, they're in their <laughs> sweet spot. They're in this. The one the one I'm just wondering if they can replace is Wade Egan if something happened to him because he's now. Uh, oh, what happened to Joey Lussick? Did he go to judiciary last night? I don't know. Oh, Freddie Lussick, sorry. Can you check that, Jordan? Uh, ask Gus. Darcy. Some of the best nicknames of all time you can remember. Rugby league nicknames. Nicknames? Yeah. My favourite one is uh, Andrew Leeds. Jumper. Jumper. <laughs> the simple ones are the best, aren't they? Jumper Leeds. Anything else? Uh, I'm sure I think. Phil Sigsworth? Yeah, yeah. What's a packeter? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Who else? Mm. Well, what Freddie goes? What was Freddie? Because Jack Gibbons didn't know his name. Is that no? I can no? tell you the whole. It's a long, long story. That one. Is that's, it? that's a long story. Was it Jack Gibson? Did he have yeah, Jack there? Gibson called him Freddie. But I know why he called him Freddie. Oh. It's it's a long story. Right. It's how Horry Hastings ended up with Horry Hastings. I know who gave him the nickname, and I know right. why. But it's a long story. Why? I'll, I'll I'll tell you the story one day. Why are it, you it, Gus? Eh? Why are you Gus? I've, I've answered that a thousand times. Get on the bus, Gus. Oh. Kenny Wilson gave me that. Oh. Um, We're out on a road run. He wanted me to jump on the bus. He didn't think I was going to make it. <laughs> he sounds like a good bloke, Kenny Wilson. Champion. Kenny Wilson was responsible for 300 nicknames in rugby league. Oh, was he? Yeah. And and when he was at Penrith, um, he, he was there at Penrith in my very early days. He used to call everyone. Um, so if your name's Matt Thompson, your surname's Thompson. So we'd call you Tommy Thompson or Timmy Thompson. All right? <laughs> so you, your first yeah. name was where you were. So it was... Um, Shifty Sheens, yeah. uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, uh, Wally Wynn, all that sort of So they just give you a name. Now, we had a player out there called Ross Gig, and Ross Gig's father, was his name was Horry. I'd never heard the Christian name Horry before. No. Right, Horry. Playing out there was Bob O'Reilly, yeah. right? and Bob O'Reilly was one of the funniest men, still is one of the funniest men you'll ever meet in your life. So we had a guy called Merv Hayward, so they called him Horry Hayward after... Ross Giggs' father. I'm I'm lost, but anyway. Yeah, yeah. but that's Horry Hay or Wally. So yeah. you, that's what your nickname was. Right. That's how I got Gus Gould. Right. Right. But um, Bob O'Reilly now goes to East and Parramatta after us. All right. He goes to East and he walks into uh, Hastings, Kevin Hastings. He says, Oh, Horry Hastings. It's stuck. Horry Hastings. <laughs> Right, he then goes to Parramatta and he plays under Jack Gibson, who wins the comp, and it starts at Parramatta. This nickname thing, Wally Win, and all this sort of yeah. stuff, and all that sort of thing. So, so, so I, oh, Jack man. Gibson, Jack Gibson must have got onto it, and he's oh. coaching the Origin side. Oh. <laughs> so in walks Brad Fittler, and he said, <laughs> "Here he is, Freddie Fittler." Oh, there you go. That's what it was. Oh, there you go. That's where it, that's how it's because that's what we would. That's where nicknames were sort right. of coming from. Okay, it had Freddy. nothing nothing to do with anything other than Freddie Fittler. <laughs> Or, or Jack didn't know they his didn't name. Didn't take that long. Probably that was that too. Yeah, um, but that's got... how that's how it's done. That's how uh, I'm sure that's how Horry Hastings got his name because Bob O'Reilly had been at Penrith when they were calling Merv Hayward Horry Hayward, 
It's just funny. How, how to bruise a clock and he's not even in. <laughs> because he was a bruiser. He wasn't in the system. He wasn't. Hey, uh, all right. <laughs> we, might have, we, we might have had a different nickname. For, <laughs> we might have had a different um, nickname for him. Six tackle. Yeah, we've got some good stuff coming up. Not necessarily league related. Six tackle trivia, Olympic theme. In keeping with the sporting theme of the week, which is golf. Double prong question. You ready? Golf is now an Olympic sport. What's that's me trivia question? Well, just wait. Yeah, go on. When was golf first contested at an Olympic Games? Secondly, can you name for me the winners of the men's and women's gold medal in golf at the last Olympics? I'm going to say it was, oh, my memory, three times ago, I think the, the, the Pommy bloke won it, the English one. Golf was first contested at Olympic Games in 1900. Oh, was it? In 1904. Right. And then most recent, and then it was out of, out of the schedule until... Justin Rose won in 2016. Justin Rose, that's Well it. done. Yeah, Justin Rose. So who won the gold, men's and women's gold medals at the last Olympics in Tokyo, which was 2021? I, I think the men's was Xander Schoffler. Well done. Was it? Yeah. yeah. Who's very consistent on the PGA Tour, and he's got a chance in the Masters this week. Mm-hmm. Um, the best women's player nearly I've ever seen is Nellie Corder. Well done. Done, Gussie. But she's uh, she's a, a wonderful golfer. Beautiful what about golfer. a beautiful golf swing? Yeah, just uh, some people are just made for it. Just made for it. Well, let's let's continue along that theme. I didn't know golf was played in the early 1900s. 1900. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know either. I, I had an idea it was earlier, but I didn't realise it was that that long ago. So Masters here on nine this week. This is the place to watch it. The par three contest Thursday tomorrow morning five till seven, live on Jam and Nine now. Then. Coverage 5 a.m. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, except on Monday when it's at 4 a.m. right through until the end. Always, a, But that Monday morning in the Masters is always fantastic. Nine Gem and Nine Now. If you head to uh, to Nine Now, you get all the – you get Amen Corner and I think there's select groups there and, and all sorts of things. So I've got the, the pairings for the opening round for you, Gus. Now, I think Jason Day can do something this week. Well, he's playing with Tiger Woods in the first round. I heard a very good. Um, I've been watching all the prelims leading into this and listening to all the commentary. I love the golf, mm. uh, and a number of really good judges. Jason Day's been going through swing changes mm. uh, over the last eighteen months, and he's really persevered. He's playing some good golf. It, it's it's a course Augusta that throws up people that have done well, well there previously, um, and uh, Jason Day has performed well there. I think he's had a second or a third. Yeah, a he's, I think he's been top five and top ten. Yeah, so he's uh, he's certainly in good form. He's a good putter, uh, which you need to be at Augusta. And uh, he's got a high ball flight, which you need to be at Augusta because the greens are so hard and sloping. Um, yeah, so, I, I yeah, he's a, he's a chance, no risk. Uh, what else can I tell you about the group? Well, Adam Scott with Sam Burns and Cameron Young. Now, he, he hits it mild, Cameron Young. Mm-hmm. Um, they'll be playing together. Adam Scott, the only Australian to ever have won the US Masters, of course. Um, Jordan Spieth, Ludwig Arbert, the, the young gun. He'll be off second last group on uh, on uh, the opening round. Of course, all the live players are there as well. So look, it's the very best of the best. Scheffler, McElroy, Schoffler. Gee, that's a group, isn't it? Mm. Wow. Thursday night footy, live and free on nine from McDonald Jones Stadium, where it's going to be significantly drier than it was last week. Newcastle versus Roosters. Newcastle, same team as last week, but they might get Greg Marzu back on a wing. He's been named on an extended bench for the Roosters. Whoa, changes galore. Uh, Joey Manu's fullback with Teddy out. Luke Keery's going to play half. Connor Watson's going to play 5 eighth. Um, with uh, Sam Walker gone. Junior Pong is in for the suspended Dominic Young. Now, I thought Sanders Smith would be there somewhere, but he must be hurt too, Gus, because Zach Docker Clay's on the bench. Um, and there's a few names, a few of the younger Roosters have been named on the extended bench, so it just goes to show that they are uh, they're being stretched a little bit uh, in terms of replacements because they've got so many out. But Newcastle very settled. The Roosters, not so much. No, nah, it's, a, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Uh, I thought the Roosters were obviously very good in the second half the other night. They, they got their dander up and they showed how physical they can be and... Uh, in difficult conditions, nearly snatched a win from nowhere. But a um, uh, different story up at Newcastle. Uh, gee whiz. It's a hard one. Uh, I'm going to go Rooster. Rooster? Rooster. Oh. I know it's favourites, are they? Yeah. yeah Short-price favourites. I'm going to go Rooster. Wow. There's a shock to start. 
Now, what can you tell me about the Bulldogs team? Stephen Crichton's going to line up at fullback with Blake Taff, 11-day stand down. Patolo's been named. King's been named. All those blokes that got knocked around last week. And you got a, you got a debut player on the bench. Yeah, young debut player, Bailey Hayward, will make his debut for the club. That thing is for certain. I don't think all the other positions are all that certain at the moment. I'd imagine that they had to put a team on paper last mm. night for Teamless Tuesday. Um, but there are still a fair few walking wounded around there. Let's just have a look and see on the bench. Um, yeah, there's several on the bench there that I saw training with the side uh, right. on Monday evening. Uh, their big session is tonight. Uh, they'll train at the same time they play, around 6pm. And then if the captain's run tomorrow, I'd imagine they'll give a number of players to the last minute. Um, we've already had to seek exemption for young Harry Hayes to sit on the bench because he's not a top 30 player. He's not even a development player. So we had to uh, get permission to name him in the top 23. Mm. And there may be others. You know, we'll just wait and see um, how it goes. Poasa from Asili's coming out from a few weeks off. Um, yeah, so... Gee. Yeah. Been we, knocked around a bit. We've got uh, Melbourne this week, then we've got Newcastle Knights, then we've got the bye. So hopefully um, we can get through the next couple of weeks with less uh, unscathed and then regroup again. But... Um, yeah. No luck. Oh, well, Good win last happen, week. It happens in footy. All right. Friday night footy up at Suncorp. Our Queensland gurus will be at the ground. I'm sure it'll be packed out because it's Brisbane versus Dolphin. Wayne Bennett's back. Yeah, well, Reese Walsh has been named. Yep. Ezra Mam, they say, had a cork the other day, so he's all right. But the big news today is that Jordan Ricky is out. He's broken down at training. And also Deloise Hoyter, who is part of this uh, 30 men score for Brisbane, has done, I think he's done a knee. He's out for the season. Wow. So, um, and there's a few falling over up at Brisbane as well. Of course, no Adam Reynolds, part of this game. And um, uh, Dean Mariner got hurt last week too. So Corey Oates is back back on the wing. Yep. Um, for the Dolphins, Flegler's going to back up after hurting the shoulder, but Felice Cafusi's out. So too is Herbie Farmworth. But they've still got a fairly formidable side there. And uh, I see Anthony Milford gets a reprieve on the bench. Yep. Now, is Rhys Walsh definitely going to play? I believe so. Well, He's got pink headgear on. That's a big tick. That's a big tick. Uh, that's a tough one. I'm, I might go with the old coach. I reckon they can win too. That's I, three bucks. I might go with the old coach. Jeez, I've tipped a couple of upsets. Yeah. yeah. I reckon they can win too. I might go with the old coach. Wow. Dolphin to win Friday night footy. Ooh, two upsets for Gussie. Yeah, local derbies. They're, they're hard to predict sometimes. Okay, three o'clock Saturday. Gee, it's a good day footy Saturday. Warriors Manly. What a game. What a game this over, is, over is, in Auckland. This is a serious game. So Dallin's um, back. So is Kirk Capel. He's had concussion. Roger the centres. Pompey out. Uh, and Mitch Barnett goes to prop where he's been playing uh, more commonly because Capel comes back on the edge. Ben Trebojevic goes to the centres. Garrick got knocked out last week. That didn't, you know what, that went against them in the first couple of minutes and they still won against Penrith. Mm. Um, and Bullimore's on the bench because Waddell's in the back row. So... So here's, here's, here's the Manly Seagulls who's just belted the three-time premiership winners and they're going to start outsiders in this game, mm. which shows you, I think, how good the Warrior is going. I've been very impressed with the Warrior. What about Nathan Brown against Penrith? He was coming off the he, back fence. He wound it back a couple of years, eh? Mm. Coming off the back fence. He's always been a physical beast. Sometimes he's overstepped the mark there and found the ire of the judiciary and... He's had a few little injury problems, but fit and well, he's always been a fierce competitor. Uh, it's a hard one. I'll go with the home side, the Warrior. Mm -hmm. Warriors at home. What are you looking for? Three in a row now? One before. Yeah, right. they beat Newcastle. And... Yeah. Uh, well, here we go. 5.30. What a gripping game. Parramatta versus North Queensland. Mm. So I mentioned that change uh, in the halves with uh, young... Uh, Blaze Talungi out. Dejan Arcee's in. Mike Acevo's been wrestled. Mm -hmm. uh, and for North Queensland, let me just have a look here. Uh, Zach Labor. Oh, I did an ACL. Poor bloke. So Tom Chester's come in. Uh, any other changes for para? Uh, Vidimu Greg and Blaze Talungi are out. Yeah, Harper in for Sevo. Play Santa Simons into the wing and Arcee into 5 eighth. Oh, Cartwright's back. Well, that's, that's, a, that's an advantage. Hmm. Yeah. Now, Cowboy last week uh, looked as though they are going to have a big win, but the team running last in the competition got back to 28-22 and were really coming to get them. Yeah. 
and threw an intercept, which changed the result. I yeah. think. I think. I think Titans were coming to get them. Cowboys were out on their feet. They're a weird team, the Cowboys. Um, and I would, at the moment, rate Eels far superior, even though they haven't been winning. I'd rate them superior to the Titans. So uh, this is incredible that the Eels at home at Combank, uh, two dollars thirty-four outsiders against the Cowboys. Um, and, you know, off the desperation of you know, a couple of weeks playing without Moses, can they resurrect? I, I like the fact that Dejan Arzi's come in. Um, I'm hoping he plays the game manager role and just allows Dylan Brown to, to be a ball runner. He's a handy player, Dejan Arzi. I think Arzee. sheer desperation. I think Cowboys can be beaten. I want to see them win away from home before I'm totally convinced. Uh, I'm going to go Eel. Eel. Another upset as far as the bookies go. Here's the game, eh? Saturday night footy down at the down at the triangle. <laughs> Last place they want to go. Now, I'll tell you what is exciting. Oh, they're playing at A core, aren't they? Oh, it's a core. Sorry, well phew, calm down. It's not in the triangle. It's oh. at a core. Yeah. Um, Jai Gray. First grade debut, and they get young Munro back on the wing. So that's exciting. Yep. Um Hawkins stays at half. Now Mama Zealous in because Damien Cook's been dropped. I oh, honestly I thought it would be. I never thought I'd envision a day when Damien Cook would be dropped, but he's gone. Um, so that's what's happening with them. And just one change to the team for the Sharks that beat the Raiders with um, Britton Nakora back and Talakai to the bench. Yep. Uh, shark. Couldn't yeah, couldn't tip him at the moment. Sunday footy, big tribute to Golden Boots Keith Barnes at Campbelltown Stadium, live and free here on 9 from 3 p.m. The Tigers. Um, Bateman's out, so Safarth starts in the back row. Samuela Fainu's out. Latu Faino is out as well. So Matamua and uh, uh, Kapoa come in. And Jape Simpkin also hasn't played so far this year. Harmay Selly back from a calf injury at prop. So Jack DeBellin goes to the bench. And Michael Molo out for the Dragons. Eisenhuth has been named to start, but he's been coming off the bench pretty regularly. And Jack Bird, he looked like he was gone last week. Yeah. We are thinking season over. Well, he came back on the field and he sweeped the play, which is a great relief. Yep. Uh, again, this is only a guess. I, I'm going to tip Dragon. Um, but Jesus, wouldn't be surprised if Tiger wins. But I'm going to tip Dragon. Oh, it's I've, upset week. I've gone all the outsiders. Yeah. I? Uh, you won't be going the outsiders here, will you? No, Raider. Canberra, <laughs> Canberra Titans. Raider will be too good for Titan down there in Canberra, and that's the round. So let's go back to the start. I'm going to tip Rooster to beat Knight, even though it's up in Newcastle. Uh, I'm going to tip Dolphin to beat Bronco. Wow. I think Wayne Bennett might have the trick there. I'm going to tip Warrior to beat Seagull. Warrior's a favourite. I'm going to tip Eel to beat Cowboy. Bounce back this week. Shark to beat Rabbit. Dragon. Dragon. No, I'm, I've got no opinion. I'm just going to pick Dragon to beat Tiger. Where yeah. do you reckon? Where do you reckon they'll line up? Because Lomax and Sloan swap last week. I did for a little while. Yeah, I think Sloan will go back to fullback. They're yeah. going to need Sloan at fullback. Mm-hmm. They, they need points. Mm-hmm. Um, and Raider to beat Titan. Very good. Very interesting round. Oh, that's what I wanted to mention too. Last week we talked about um, Blake's coaching against brothers as a player. You're right about Brian and Tony Smith. Yes. Very good. Yes. And oh, Mido sent me a whole bunch of others. Let me see if I can bring it up here quickly. But, see, Mido, he gets very creative because there's captain coaches. Oh, yeah, this would be back in the 30s or 20s or 30s or something. Right? Brian Smith coached against Tony in 91. Norm Proven, captain coach against Peter Proven. Yep. Does that count? Yeah. Johnny Raper, captain coach versus Ron Raper, Mori Raper, to name a few. Okay. There you are. Um, and Tony, I didn't realize, I forgot Tony Smith played for the Steelers. So Brian Brian was coach of the Dragons and Tony's playing for the Steelers. Hmm. How about that? Thank you, mate. Covered plenty of today and uh, great round of footy coming up again on nine. And make sure you, uh, well, you don't sleep much anyway. So the, you'll be sweet for the Masters, 5 a.m. My time of year. Plenty to watch on TV. 100%. Oh, and well done to the Matildas. They've had a 2 to win over the Mexican team while we've been recording our podcast today. And uh, they're off to Paris. See you next week. This year, NRL on nine is your one-stop shop for all footy. That's right, Freddie. Not about the highlights. Action. Seven days a week. Billy and Gus podcast. Get them on your drive on the way home. Immortal behaviour. Grab a seat on the couch for that. And, of course, my favourite, Freddie and the Young. The best footy brains, the biggest games. Don't trust the algorithm. Subscribe to NRL on 9 and get all your entertainment there.